together. I have two, two prayer requests that I've, I've prayed for a long time or answered today. And one of them, I have a deep burden in my heart as a pastor for all the prodigals that are represented by the sons and daughters at EBC who have walked away from Jesus. And I have a yearning for prodigals to come home. And uh, Isaac was one of those that uh, my wife and I, in our regular prayers, we prayed for Isaac by name. And we've known Isaac um, since he was just uh, the size of William and younger. Uh, in those times, we've known them. I still remember Isaac coming over to our home. We had a little above ground pool, and it was his first encounter with a pool. That's one of the first memories I really remember, we could not get him in the water, and then once we got him in the water, we couldn't get him out. We eventually had to pull him out uh, and send him crying home. But um, uh, I've prayed for Isaac for these years, and uh, I'm just so grateful for God's mercy to reclaim and restore. Uh, and we've all known it in our own individual lives and uh, represented around our congregation are a number of people who are crying out to God for people who have walked away from Jesus, who've heard about him, but have not decided uh, to follow his way of love and grace. And so I'm just so grateful for that today. So touches me. All right, well, here we are. We're in a series on eschatology, on a study of the last things. And so if you're dropping in here and you're a visitor, uh, this is kind of a, an interesting moment to drop in uh, because you're coming in after a year's worth of dealing with topics uh, that uh, have prepared us to come to where we are right now. So it's like picking up a novel and opening up the last chapter and starting to read in the last chapter, right? And if you're a, a reader, uh, that just is abhorrent to most people. I just say most people because uh, I have a reader in my home. Uh, her name will remain nameless, uh, and, but she, she will not read the book until she's assured that it's going to end well. And if she picks it up and it's not going to end well, well, it ain't making it off the shelf into her arms, all right? Uh, thankfully, the scriptures have a good ending, right? That's centered in uh, the work of Jesus Christ according to God's will by the power of the Spirit. So but you're dropping in kind of at the end of the story uh, where we're looking at eschatology uh, is a, uh, a term that is used within Christian circles uh, to refer to talking about the end of the story, about what God is going to do when he wraps up the history. And of course, that has a lot of assumptions in it. It assumes that there is a God, that there is a God who has a plan, and that he is working toward a particular goal and end. Uh, and eschatos, the, these two terms that are here, it's really a, a blend of two Greek terms that have been coined to describe it. Eschatos means end. Lagos means a word or a discourse about the future about the end. And so, as I've written here, the study of what God, the one from whom, through whom, and to whom are all things, right? This is the, comes from the doxology of Paul in Romans chapter 11, the very last verse, where he recites the fact that God is the one who has, it was the source of everything. God is the one who sustains everything that exists, and God is moving everything toward the goal for which he created it. So it creates a kind of a linear view of history, that it's moving towards something. We're not in endless cycles where you get reincarnated and hope to come back a better you the next time, right? We're not in circles, or we're not aimlessly going, or we're not in a cosmos where you just happen to exist, and you're an interesting accident, and nobody created you. Uh, you're going to exist really for just a blip in time, given the length of eternity and the cosmos itself. And then you're going to appear, your life is going to be interesting, but it has no design or no purpose or really any direction uh, or any sense in which you can say that it's meaningful. And then you will die, and then eventually within a couple generations you will be forgotten. That's the major view that's held up in many of our secular circles today, that you live in a world without God, without design, without purpose. Well, in the biblical world, you live with a God who has created the world, a God who's sustaining the world, a God who's moving things toward the goal for which he's made them. So no matter what we read in terms of the headlines and uh, the to and fro of nations, which Jesus is going to address in our own passage today, no, they aren't in charge, right? As God would speak in Isaiah chapter 40 and say the nations are but a drop in the bucket and God will bring things toward his goal. So this God is the one who tells us about what will happen in the future to every individual. This is often called personal eschatology that involves the destiny of every person. 
and of everything, what will happen to everything. And the thing about the Bible is it's concerned with the whole of creation. It begins with God's creation of everything, and it ends with God's reclamation and restoration of everything, people included. All right, so the story of eschatology. Now today, I want you to open your Bibles, if you would, and I want you to turn to Mark chapter 13. Mark chapter 13. In each one of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the Gospels, the good news about the story of the birth, life, death, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus. You have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Uh, in these, all of them have uh, a record of Jesus uh, talking about the future. And so here we're going to look at a short passage, about the shortest one that we can look at within the Gospels. In Mark chapter 13, it's often referred to as the little apocalypse. Apocalypse is a Greek word meaning the little revelation that gets associated in our conversation with the end. Uh, and uh, biblically, it just means a revelation, uh, but it talks about uh, the revelation of the end. Actually, the book Revelation, its Greek term is apocalypse, right? So it's the revelation of what will happen at the wrap-up of time. And so when we come to uh, uh, eschatology, the wrap-up of time, we began last week uh, by talking about the first of the events, according to our understanding of Scripture, that's going to occur. And we talked about the rapture of God's people or the gathering up or the assumption of God's people to meet Christ in the air. That Christ is going to come and gather his people and meet them in the air. Now we're going to move forward, according to the biblical timeline, and talk about a day that's referred to as the Day of the Lord. Now we introduced this last week when we talked about 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians 4 talked about the rapture. 1 Thessalonians 5 talked about what follows the assumption of God's people to heaven. Now I just want to pause here for just a moment. And I want, to, I want to, to, uh, for us to be reminded as the people of God, and if you're a young person here or a follower of Jesus Christ, there is something core to the teaching of Scripture is not only that Jesus came and that Jesus was the God-man, that he was fully God and fully man. So he had all the powers and character of God, but he was also fully human. And it, Scriptures affirm that he died on a cross, and when he died, it wasn't just any human, it was the God-man dying. And so it wasn't someone being taken up on the cross by the Romans. It was Christ going up on the cross himself. And something that was happening on that cross was that he was bearing the sins of the world. He was stepping up onto that cross to take onto himself the curse of God that we had earned by virtue of our rebellion against him. And he did that, and we needed a perfect man to go up there so that he wasn't dying for his own sins. And we also needed a man that was God so that he could bear the weight of what was happening on that cross. So Jesus went up on that cross. He died for our sins, and he was buried. And if we were in Jerusalem at the time he was buried, AD 30, 33, we would be there, and we would see where they put him in the tomb. And then three days later, they went to that tomb, and he had walked out of that tomb. And he was standing outside, and he met Mary Magdalene, and he met John, and he met Peter, and then he met over 500 people. And so the scriptures are not talking about mythology. They're not talking about, you know, the Chronicles of Narnia. They're not talking about some uh, fairy tale story. We're talking about real events in history. And then in history, Christ appeared to his disciples over a period of 40 days. He confirmed the reality of his resurrection. He confirmed his deity. It put approval on everything that he did, right, to demonstrate that he was who he said he was. And then he ascended into heaven. And he ascended into heaven in front of the disciples with them watching from a real place on the globe that was Jerusalem. Now it says in scripture that he's waiting right now and the whole of the Christian hope is that we're waiting for him to come back just as he left. Okay? So one of the uh, the fundamental affirmations of believers is not only that Jesus died, that he rose, but that he's coming. And without him coming, there is no resolution to the story. Without him coming, the resurrection and the, and the cross are really interesting moments, right? Interesting to talk about, but ultimately they offer no hope for the world and for us, right? So we're stepping into something, and I say that to you because I, I've mentioned to you over and over again that when I was younger, especially when I was in high school and college, 
People would talk about the return of Jesus, and I was all happy about that because I didn't like hell. I didn't like to talk about hell. Hell was scary. I didn't think about that. I knew my own life was broken. I had things that were out of sync with what God had desired for me. I didn't like hell, and I was glad that heaven was out there in front of me. But all the time, I was very glad for God to wait until I got like 85 and I couldn't walk anymore. Right? Okay, beam me up, Jesus, then. But it wasn't a, wasn't a real hope. It wasn't a real aspiration. It didn't really shape my life. Matter of fact, I was just glad to kind of shunt it off into the distance. And so the future never shone its light into the present to reshape Greg. And I remember coming aware of that and recognizing that in the word of one theologian that heaven, for all intensive purposes, had become eclipsed. It was just a good retirement package out there somewhere, but that hope never reshaped my life in the present. So a part of what we're doing today is we're not trying to be speculative, and we're trying not to talk about more things than we should. We're not trying to get into all kinds of speculation about where we are at this given moment in time and what exactly God's doing prophetically and so forth and so on. What we're trying to do is we're trying to listen to the words of Jesus, either coming directly from him as recorded in the Gospels or coming indirectly to us through his authorized representatives like the Apostle Paul last week. And we want to know everything about what's to come that Jesus has revealed to us. Because if it's important enough for him to reveal it to us, it's important for us to pay attention to it. And our political season needs to be informed by eschatology. Our political season needs to be informed by eschatology. Right? Our lives need to be informed by it. For high school students, for people that are thinking about getting married, for people who are newly married, for people who are parents, Right? It needs to be informed by the fact that this is not a random set of events. We're not all just hurtling through space and we're interesting meatballs that are heading somewhere. No, there's a God who is ruling and reigning. He's moving things toward its end. And what will happen in the end, according to biblically, is that everything will be swept up before God. And what you've done with him will be the only thing that really matters. And today is a day to be serious about that, right? Both for your joy, for your protection, right? And for your flourishing, and for your focus today. So we come to to, uh, 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 Mark 13, and what Jesus is going to do is he's going to dig into this day called the Day of the Lord. And this Day of the Lord is always associated with two ideas in Scripture, vindication and judgment, right? The protection, the rescue of his people, and the judgment of those who have stood against him. This is the teaching of Jesus consistently through. It goes back to Old Testament preparation for it. So here, a key passage in 1 Thessalonians 1, 9, and 10. They tell how you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who, here's the vindication side, rescues us and judgment from the coming wrath. Okay? So the idea here, and then we talked about the day of the Lord is something that's going to come suddenly and unexpectedly to bring judgment. Right? So this is our topic today, is what we want to talk about is the day of the Lord, okay? Uh, uh, I think I'm green for go, but I'm not moving, Steve, so you can click me forward here. I don't know what I'm missing here. Just push me one more forward if you can. All right, so here we are in Mark 13. So if you're there, are you in Mark 13? If you don't have a, a copy of the scriptures, you can look up on the screen here, and I've given you uh, the topic. And this is Jesus stepping in, Uh, toward the end of his life and ministry. He's just followed a set of episodes where he's had great conflict with the Jewish leaders who have rejected him. And matter of fact, at this point in time, they've stepped away and they're no longer engaging him because they think it's fruitless and because they wind up looking bad every time they engage him. And so they've stepped away from that. So it's in an environment where the disciples are recognizing that they're following a rabbi that's hated by almost every other rabbi. It's an interesting place to be in, and he's telling them about that. And also, Jesus is facing his upcoming death. And the disciples have all been uh, uh, struggling all along with their ideas of a Messiah because they have very worldly ideas of a Messiah, and they're thinking that Jesus is going to immediately go up and rule and reign, and they're not wrong about him ruling and reigning. They're just wrong about the timing, and they're wrong about what needs to happen before he does rule and reign. They want him to go right up there. You can see this in chapter 8 where Peter's all messed up when Jesus tells them he's going to suffer and die. And Peter immediately corrects him, like, Jesus, you've got to get your Messiah right. And the idea is they don't have a place for a suffering 
uh, dying Messiah because they don't want to follow a suffering dying Messiah because it means they're going to have to go the way of the cross too. They want a triumphing Messiah right away. And so Jesus is preparing them not only for the opposition and to speak to the fact that judgment is coming, but he's also going to speak to the idea that vindication is coming. But his main point is to try to reorient them toward their life in the present. This is always the point of looking at the end times in Scripture, is to always bring people back to how should we live today? How should we live today, given the fact that we know what's going to happen? How should we live today? And so as Jesus is here, uh, he's just had this conflict. He's getting ready to on the cross and, and what's going to look like a reversal to them that they're going to have to struggle with, right? But Jesus has to die, if you know the biblical storyline. If the king doesn't die, the kingdom, when he establishes it, will not have any inhabitants because all the rebels will be shut out, unforgiven. So the king has to go up to the cross and die in order to make a opening for anyone to come back underneath the king's rule that they've spurned. And so Jesus has to do something absolutely essential, and it's God's grace and mercy that he's going to go up on a cross and die, and then he gives the present time in which we live as a time of patience to allow people to come in relationship to him. Okay? Because when he returns, it's going to be a time of judgment. The disciples were wrestling with this. So they've lost sight of the moment in which they're in, and so now they draw their attention. They're looking at the temple here, uh, one of the wonders of the world in the ancient world. And so here they stand, and they're looking over at the temple and all the buildings around it, which King Herod has beautified over like a 19-year period of time as a monument to himself and a way to placate the Jews of his moment. And so here they're looking. It said, Jesus was leaving the temple. One of the disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what massive stones, what, what magnificent buildings. If you go to Israel today, you can see those Stones that Herod had carved, they're one of the wonders of the ancient world. They're massive stones that make up the Temple Mount. So they're looking at this architecture and they're just awed by it. Well, Jesus just kind of puts a little damper on their, their wonderment, right? I don't know if you've ever had any friends like that. They're trying to enjoy the day and somebody drops a Bible verse on you or something, right? So here's Jesus. Do you see all these great buildings, replied Jesus? Not one stone here will be left on another. Everyone will be thrown down. Well, that's a little jarring. Right? They're celebrating the, the beauty of the temple, and Jesus says, well, all this is going to come crumbling down, and it's going to come crumbling down in the idea that God's going to judge it. Right? So Jesus corrects their vision at this moment because Jesus knows that the time of his departure is nearing, that he knows that this, this conflict between him and the Jewish authorities who have rejected him, it's coming to a peak. Right? And there they are, disconnected from the realities of what's going on in the moment, saying, man, aren't these great buildings? Okay? So Jesus is arresting their attention to correct their vision because he needs to go into some important uh, information to prepare them for what's going to happen as he changes. So we move on then. Now, we, the story moves a little bit here. Uh, Jesus, uh, apparently with the disciples, they've come out of the temple. They've gone down, probably come out of the the uh, southern entrance to the temple, one of the main entrances. And when you come out the southern end, then you drop into the Kidron Valley. It's a little valley. And then if you go up and you keep heading east, you go up onto Mount of Olives. Okay? This is an surrendering of what they would have been looking at in the first century from the best we know from archaeology. They were looking at those, the temple mount or those walls all along the bottom. They were looking at those impressive stones that... A heritage land, a beautiful temple of white that's standing out there, one of the wonders of the ancient world. And they're sitting there admiring that. And as Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, and John, and Andrew ask him privately, Tell us what will these, when will these things happen? Okay? So, Jesus, you just talked about the stones of the temple being knocked down so that there's not one stone left on top of another stone, and really just a, a figure of speech for it's going to be utterly destroyed, it's going to be utterly torn down. And he says, well, when, what is the sign? Jesus, give us the, the sign of when this is going to happen. Tell us when it's going to happen. Now, what I want you to see here is I've written on the side here is that Jesus is not going to answer their question because they're asking the wrong question. 
So the disciples are focusing on when will everything be all over? They're just wanting to right to the end. The same problem that they have all, all together, they want Jesus not to go into Jerusalem and go up on a cross and die. They want Jerusalem to go, he want him to go into Jerusalem as a conquering king and establish the kingdom and so that they can rule right along with him. Right? If you want to see their aspirations, you can go back to Mark chapter 8 and read that end of the chapter there where, where uh, uh, James and John sidle up alongside of Jesus and uh, under the instigation of their mom, and they come up to Jesus privately and they say, hey, Jesus, when you get into the kingdom, why don't you give my brother left-hand uh, authority and I'll take the right-hand authority? How about that, Jesus? And the other disciples overhear it, and they go, well, hey. And they don't go, oh, how ungodly that is. How? No, they're, they're just upset that somebody got there before they did, right? And so they all throw in, and here's all the, the leaders, the early disciples. They're all fighting each other over who's best in the kingdom. And Jesus goes, you guys don't understand what it means to be in the kingdom. First, I'm going to have to suffer and die. And if you're going to be first in the kingdom, you've got to be last. Because the Son of Man did not come to be served, Mark 10, 45, okay, but to give his life a ransom for many. So they don't have an understanding of what it means, and they're climbers, they're graspers. They keep thinking right now, when's it going to be over? I was thinking about this in terms of an analogy uh, to myself. Uh, there was one summer, okay, anybody can identify with this if you're a current high school student or about this age, I think I was about in high school. Um, we had a chain link fence around the back of our yard. Okay, you can see them all around Xenia, little chain link fence, fences that are here. After a while, they start to rust. Well, my dad grew up uh, in the fact that your chain was your public face to the world. You're not having any rusting chain around Richard Kauser, right? And back then, to paint the chain, you needed, you had to paint all these poles, they're just poles, and then chain link. Well, the chain link was rusting. So the first thing I had to go and had to use a wire brush and go knock off all of the rust, well, I never knew our fence was so long. Right? I never knew it was so long, I never even paid attention to our fence. Right? And we didn't have a big house. We, had, we lived over on Ridgebury Drive over here. We didn't have a big house. It wasn't big, but man, alive, that it just needed to be like you know, six feet, and that would have been great with that. And, and, and I, I would ask my dad, well, what do I have to do? Well, you gotta, first you've got to go through and scrape it all, and then you've got to go back and paint it. And the paint that you had was this aluminum type of paint that, that had solids in it that would sink to the bottom. And so every time you opened it, you had to stir it all really hard. Who knows? It was probably toxic. Who knows what it is now? Uh, explains all the things about me today. But I'm doing that, and it was in the middle of summer, and it was hot, and the stuff would get stuck. I wanted to know from my dad, is, Dad, when can I stop working? That's all I wanted to know. I didn't want to know. He would, he would explain to me in great detail. You scrape all this off, and then here's how. And you, if you've seen those chain links, you can run a... A roller, and it goes down like at an angle, like this, to go through them. And then you got to do it on the other side. So you got to do it on both sides. And you got to make sure it doesn't drip everywhere. And then, of course, my dad, he was quality control when you got home. Right? He'd come out, miss this, Greg, and you missed that. And I hated those moments. I missed that one. You missed that one. Right? He'd come home at the end of the day. And I knew there would always be some reckoning. But all I wanted to know was, okay, Dad, when is this over? How long do I have to do this? Give me the sign of the end. That's really, I, want. I, don't, I don't care about what you want me to do. I don't care about life today. I just want to know how long do I have to do it? Do I have to do it like three hours in a row? Do I have to do it like two weeks? Dad, do I have to keep doing this? And this was in the middle of my summer break, right? There was nothing breaky about that from my perspective, right? And so this is the same mentality of disciples. They're not saying, Jesus, what do we need to do to follow you well today? They're saying, Jesus, when is it all going to be over? And this is the wrong sense of a person being heavenly minded that they're so no earthly good. They're just thinking, I just want to know when it's all over and I'm just want, I just don't want to think about how to live in the present. Just tell me when it's over, right? And Jesus is going to come back and he's not going to give them the sign. That's one of the things you're not going to find. He's not going to give them the sign. And matter of fact, as I understand the passage, he's not even going to tell them when the temple itself is going to be turned upside down. Okay, so let's talk about that. So here's what he does. So in response, Jesus changes their focus. It's as if he's saying, focus on following me now in the path of suffering, knowing that a day of vindication and judgment is coming. Okay? So he wants us to embrace the call that he is going to make on our lives in the present, 
but he's going to set that, that call on our lives over against the sure coming of Christ, his sure coming, and of his judgment, so that there is a, a need, there is an inbuilt, inbuilt sense in us that justice should be served. The cries for justice are something that are hardwired into human beings, right? Thank God that, that the greatest injustice has been taken care of by Christ dying for the unjust. The just dying for the unjust, right? But we long, and those people have been abused and hurt and, and, and attacked and killed in, in the name of Christ. Over the, there is a need for justice, and God says there will be a day of reckoning. There will be a day of reckoning, but also there will be a day of salvation. And so he wants to set against the backdrop, so today... I want to encourage you to live fully for me without pulling any punches. That's going to mean a number of negative things for you in this moment. And so I want to give you guidance. So here, if we want to look at the passage, and here I'm just giving you a a panoramic view, and then we'll come back to it. I've kind of abbreviated so I could get it here. He's actually going to go in three moves in the middle of this passage. He's first, such things must happen, but the end is not yet. So the very first section... He's going to talk about the present time, okay? Now, I can't see that really well from here because I'm being blinded by the lights up here, so I hope you can see it. It says present in that little box. The present time, what's the present time going to be like? And then here, when he says, when you see the abomination that causes desolation standing where it does not belong, those will be days of distress unequaled from the beginning when God created the world until now. So there he's going to move into the time that we call the tribulation, the time of great outpouring of God's wrath. It's referred to in the book of Revelation of the time of God's wrath here. And then he's going to end up with his second coming, the return of Christ to establish his kingdom. Okay, So he's going to make those three moves, and he's going to talk about each one of these sections as we work our way through. And we're going to follow him. Uh, I told uh, the group beforehand as I looked through this Chapter 13, I was pretty confident I was not going to make it through today, so everyone can take a sigh of relief, uh, and I won't get there. We'll come back and finish the second half on next week, uh, because uh, this is one of the things about the storyline, when you're covering the end of the storyline, and all the threads of the story are coming to bear on the end of the storyline, Jesus assumes that the disciples can bring all the threads together. Well, we're going to have to pull out some of those threads so you can understand Most of you right now, if I ask most people in verse 14 what the abomination that causes desolation is, they would say, that's a good question, okay? But that has a long Old Testament history, and we need to explore that so that we understand exactly what that is as we come there, right? The Son of Man coming, the imagery that's used here. So we need to dig into each one of those, and we'll we'll work our way there over this Sunday and next Sunday. Now, so let's begin here with this... uh, Oh, I got back the wrong direction. Here we go. Sorry. Now, Jesus in this present moment, what I want to draw your attention to, and I want you to read this with me, and then probably this is what we'll get to today before we come back to the tribulation and the second coming next week. So here we are in verse 5. They've asked him a question, and here's what he says. Watch out that no one deceives you. Many will come in my name, claiming I am he, and will deceive many. When you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. Such things must happen. But notice this this time delimiter here, this marker, this time marker. But the end is still to come. Okay, so this is not the end. These things are not characteristic of the end. They're characteristic of the present time up until the end. Okay, so we'll come back to this. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places and famines. These are the beginning of birth pains. You must be on your guard. You will be handed over to local councils and flogged in the synagogues. On account of me, you will stand before governors and kings as witnesses to them. And the gospel must first be preached to all the nations. Whenever you are arrested and brought to trial, do not worry beforehand about what to say. Now, that one always sticks to me because Jesus says this repeatedly through the gospels. Matthew 10, different places. When you're arrested, don't worry. And immediately you're thinking, don't worry, because it's going to be okay. God's going to get you out of it, right? You're going to get through it okay. Well, no, the okay is that don't worry. You'll be able to bear witness to Christ faithfully. But Jesus, wait a minute, wait a minute. Okay, that's great, Jesus. I want to bear witness faithfully. But Jesus, will I survive it? No guarantees there, Greg. Will I get released from prison? Maybe not. Right? 
The Apostle Paul bore witness to Christ and let the Spirit of God do that, and he was uh, beheaded outside the walls of Rome. Peter bore witness to Christ under all kinds of persecution, and he was crucified upside down, right? And so Jesus, the, it assumes a disciple's heart is that the most important thing in any moment is to bear witness to Jesus faithfully because that's the only thing that really matters. Because all of the big things have been taken care of. These people, to use Jesus' words in Matthew 10, don't fear the one who can kill the body, but you fear the one who can cast both body and soul into hell. Well, if you've taken care of your relationship with God, you have nothing to fear, right? So Jesus says here, don't worry, lean in on the Spirit. And then verse 12, brother will betray brother to death and father as child. Children will rebel against their parents and have them put to death. Everyone will hate you because of me, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. I do not think I have found any Christian who has put up today one of the promises of God that they want to be encouraged by today is the one right there in verse 13. Everyone will hate me because of my identification with Christ. Amen? Amen. Right? Now, so what I want to talk to you about here is the very first thing is that uh, he wants to prepare them for what they're going to experience in the present. And so one of the things that's so important <clears throat> as a believer is to have in, uh, expectations that are realistic, right? Uh, we did a wedding at our home yesterday. Uh, it was a sweet wedding, two people from, from Emmanuel, uh, Grant Johnson and Taylor Phillips. It was a sweet wedding. Uh, it was beautiful in the evening. Uh, we had fires and everything, a little chilly. But it was just a beautiful thing, a sweet celebration of their commitment to each other. Well, one of the things that you definitely need to do with uh, uh, people who are getting married is you don't go to a Disney movie and say they lived happily ever after. All right? Well, that's just lying, right? Because you got two broken people, and by God's grace, they're prepared for the journey that they're on, but they're not perfect people, and they're going to bring their, their selfishness and their pride and Sometimes their, their envy or their struggles with their own stuff right into their marriage. And when I say, I'll have you, and the other person says, well, I'll have you too, well, you get the good things and the bad things, right? I'll have that. And so you need to have realistic expectations so that you're ready for the journey. As a follower of Jesus, you need to have realistic expectations because there are a whole bunch of people out there who, who, pre who present themselves as representative of Jesus that tells you if you're obedient to Jesus, you'll be wealthy. If you're obedient to Jesus, everybody will like you. If you're obedient to Jesus, you won't get sick. If you're obedient to Jesus, things will go well. And that's just a lie from the words of Jesus. Right? If you're going to follow Jesus, you're going to be treated like Jesus. Right? And all of us know the story of Jesus. Jesus, as I've joked with you before, was the most Jesus person ever. Right? He did all the right things in all the right order, and he set them in all the right ways, and he was hated, and he was hated because he represented right, what was convicting them about their rebellion. They didn't want to give it up, so they attacked him. Okay? And if you represent him, that will happen to you. Right? Now again, this is not saying a standard, right? to say that again, I'm not saying I, I, I know that I'm faithful to Jesus today because I've got a ton of people that hate me. Right? No, 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 that's not what he's saying. What he's saying is that if you are faithful to Jesus and you go to high school and you identify with him and you speak the name of Jesus and, and you don't join in some of the things that, as Peter would say, the way people live apart from Christ who revel in it and you don't enjoy it and you don't participate in it, you're the, you're the downer on the party. You're the downer on the group. You're the person that something's weird about you. And then if you're, if you're trying to represent Christ and you confront them with their need for Christ, Beyond that, they may reject you and put you on the side. You may have to embrace loneliness to be faithful to Christ. Right? That's the reality of living Christ, following Christ in the world. That's not our aspiration to be lonely. It's not our aspiration to be hated. It's our aspiration to be faithful to Jesus and then let the chips fall where they may. Okay? So Jesus is trying to prepare for that. And here's some of the things that he gives about the way of the cross now. What does it mean to follow Jesus today? Well, he lists a number of things, and if you want to put some of them down, as you see them marked here, right, just expect people to come along and try to deceive you. You're in a moment where people are going to try to undercut your belief and trust in what God has revealed in Scripture. 
They're going to try to deceive you to trust yourself or to trust somebody else. He says there's going to be a time where there's going to be wars and violence. This is going to be a part of this present time. Well, we don't have to be convinced of that. It certainly is, right? Whether you're talking about what's happening across the landscape of the United States in our major cities, or whether you're talking about on the world stage in the Middle East or in Azerbaijan or in Africa or wherever else you want to go, right? You're going to find wars and rumors of wars because you'll find sinful, broken people trying to add to their stores to gain power, to exercise it over other people. That is the nature of this moment, right? So this is why in, in certain sense as Christians, even though we desire peace, we should be peacemakers, we're realistic about the fact that ultimately peace is not going to come until the peacemaker par excellence returns. The prince of peace, right? Now, that doesn't mean that we don't give up on, on negotiating. It doesn't mean that we aren't people who try and argue for peace, but we shouldn't be surprised that we have war and rumors of war. There is no treaty that's going to be an end to sin in the world. Okay? Jesus says this, and so he goes on. Earthquakes and famines, right? We call this natural evil or, or uh, 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 cataclysmic events that happen in various places around the world. He, he warns them that you'll be opposed by both Jew and Gentile. You'll be flogged in the synagogue, and you'll stand before governors. So the, uh, uh, you will be hated by everyone who rejects Jesus. Now, you have to hear this from the disciples' perspective. They don't expect the governors and kings to welcome them, but this is a shocker to say that I'm going to be kicked out of my synagogue. My parents are going to turn on me? You mean that? You mean my aunt and uncle? You mean the people I've grown up going to synagogue with? They're going to, they're going to hate me? Yes. Right? And then he goes on, and he says here, brother will betray brother to death and father his child. Children will rebel against their parents and have them put to death. Jesus himself said when the kingdom breaks in, it will challenge loyalties and it will bring violence. Why? Because people will reject the Lord that you serve and will see you as a freak or as an outsider as, or as your very life make them feel bad about their life when that's not your intent. You're a holier than thou whatever. Right? But it will challenge loyalties. Right? If you come to Christ... And, and right now you're in a marriage where people don't know Jesus, and now you become a follower of Jesus, will there be tension in your marriage? marriage? Very likely. Jesus promises that what happens when you challenge loyalties, people will wrestle over that. Is that the goal? No. But is the, the outworking in a fallen world? Yes. Today, right, places like Pakistan and Afghanistan, dads, and moms and brothers are killing daughters who profess Jesus. Sons who are professing Jesus are being killed by their relatives. We've got all those kind of things happening. We've got those kinds of things. Jesus says, don't be surprised. This is what happens in this moment where we live. And then finally, he says, right, here's the most encouraging one of the whole thing. Everyone will hate you. Okay? Now, we're going to end here today, but I just want to remind us as we stand here at this moment. We need to be honest about what Jesus has told us to expect from our moment. And we've talked about this many times. Sometimes in our, our culture here, especially in America, as things shift where to be a Christian used to be socially acceptable. If you had a, a biblical sexual ethic, that was the normal ethic of the culture in which you live. The way you viewed uh, the freedoms that you have and so forth and so on that were rooted in a Judeo-Christian ethic. Well, that was supposed to be respectable, if you will. Well, now you find yourself on the other side of that in many circles. Now, again, not everywhere, but certainly among the movers and shakers of our culture. And there's always an impulse in Christians to say, well, maybe something's wrong with us. And that's not a bad question to ask. But where you go to figure out whether something's wrong with us is you go to Jesus to figure that out. Because off the time we go, well, maybe if we change Jesus around, these people would like us more. And in reality, when we do that, we're not only, we're not only dishonoring Jesus, but we're actually hating our neighbor. Because if Jesus is who he says he is, what they need from us is a you and I full of Jesus, not you and I trying to recast Jesus. 
So they need you at high school. They need you at work. They need you uh, with your relatives as people who serve Jesus, love Jesus, pray to Jesus, walk with Jesus, think of him, let him guide your identity and who you are every day so that when you encounter them, the best you can and as much as they're willing to allow you, you can commend Jesus to them. Because they don't need a Jesus that makes them feel comfortable about themselves. They need a Jesus who makes them recognize their rebellion against God, and turn to Him for their salvation, for their blessing now and their eternal blessing. So as we come and think about these moments, Jesus, no punches pulled, and we come back next week, we'll talk, well, what should we be doing during this time? This is what we're expecting. Well, how do we respond to that? And Jesus is going to immediately return to that and says, here's what you need to do in that moment, and that's where we're going to begin in our next week. But would you pray with me as we conclude today? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness to us today. Um, Lord, I'm often reminded of the song uh, that we've sung as I grew up that talked about how, uh, Lord, it is not the flowery beds of ease to follow you. And Lord, it's not just in the big things of people walking into us and challenging our faith and calling us to, to, to say that we're faithful to Christ or to take our life. Lord, it's, it's us as husbands and wives choosing, Lord, to hold on to our marriages, to love tenaciously, to live past sinful behavior, to forgive and forgive again. Oh, Lord, to hold on and to trust you that, Lord, the way to live, to find life in this time is not to bow uh, to our culture that says as soon as things get difficult to give up. Lord, a, an idea that this life is all there is, so you have to grab everything that you can. And why would you hang with someone who's difficult in this time because you only have one life. And Lord, you remind us and you step in and say, no, 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 this life is not all there is. This is just a blip in time compared to eternity. And Lord, you teach us, Lord, to endure, to trust, to live. Lord, I pray, Lord, for the high school students that are here as they go to school, those in junior high. Lord, that they would hear your voice. And Lord, that we would learn as people to live for the audience of one. Lord, I pray for moms and dads I pray for grandmas and grandpas. Lord, as we love, help us to love fully. Lord, help us to be people who are on our knees. Lord, please, Lord of Emmanuel, please would you let us see many more prodigals reclaimed. God, give us a weightiness about our lives, Lord, that weights our joy, that today, Lord, one of the, the sweet, eternal, sweet thing happened that should be the, the greatest of joys that should swell up in our souls, make us clap and cheer, Lord, because something genuinely sweet went on this morning in those testimonies and baptism. Lord, help us. Help us, Lord, to walk with you. Lord, thank you for my brothers and sisters here. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.